Okay, let's get started. So welcome back to System Software. Uh, we are quickly approaching the end of the semester. So hopefully you are well into your projects. Ideally project four, which I think is due, what, one and a half weeks or so? Yeah. The week the before, last Tuesday. Last Tuesday, the last Tuesday before the exam. Yeah. So sorry to make it a little close to the exam. You know, we had the, some yeah, we had some days off in the beginning, and I pushed it back a little bit. I wanted to make it so that, you know, it's, it was due, you know, well before the exam, but oh well. Yeah, rather, have, yeah, it's better to have the time. Uh, questions? Yeah. Right, it doesn't, it doesn't, because I, yeah, I made that extra rule that said, you know, the final deadline is, uh, yeah, so there's no way to have it two weeks late. Yeah. Yeah. For the project four, when we submit it, will, will there, like, you know, like, let's say we fail the test cases, will there be a way to, like, re like get regrading for project four, or is it just one and done? Um, I guess it's pretty much one and done. I mean, you have, you'll have all the test cases. Oh, okay. So there's no more, yeah, no more secret test cases. That was a little bit too much of a pain, because some of the secret test cases were just wrong. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So you ha you'll have all the test cases. Okay. So you should, you should, should know if you've, if you've gotten the right answers. Yeah, try not to overfit your, you know, your your compiler to the test. Yeah. Project four, one of the examples is just like a call function without having to the statement, but it's not like not allowed. It calls a function without having it in a statement. Yeah, that that may not that probably isn't allowed. Yeah, no, it shouldn't be. So uh, let me make a note. Actually, let's see. Let's fix this now. So which test was it? Two. Two. I think it was three. Three. Okay. Oh, yeah, good point. Oh, and there's no, um, this doesn't make sense at all. Let's just get rid of that one. <laughs> that was easy. Oh, no, no, no. This was, this was uh, supposed to be an error. Oh, I see. The syntax is wrong. Yeah. Whoops. That was hasty. <laughs> Oopsie daisies. So let's just make it again. What was it? Example three. And it was int f, oh no, int main print gfunk. Is that right? And we need a return also. How's that look? What do you mean? There was it, no it parentheses? Was I think it was just what I wrote, you mean? No, what the, the original thing was. Okay, even more wrong. Okay, how's that? All right, thanks for the catch. Questions? Yeah. Are you really the secret test cases for project? Yeah, but they're still being constructed. Because we were, yeah, we we're planning on keeping the secret, you know, thing for a while. Uh, but, yeah. You'll get them eventually. You'll get them eventually. No problem, no problem. So any other any questions on like software security we looked at last time, stack smashing? Uh, I know we went through it like really fast. Just a little overview. Okay, okay. So this is gonna be the last lecture of like new content. The last two are gonna be review. Um, yeah, the review, you can just start with the homework questions because they're just going to be the homework questions. I posted the last two homework questions for this week's lectures. They're going to be due in like a week and a half. So, you know, after the break, you have more than a week to do those. Um, they're just very simple questions. Well, hopefully simple questions on the software security and the program analysis lecture today. And um, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it. Oh, yeah, I got an email saying, you know, that the, you, you're supposed to evaluate me in web courses, and I think it won't let you sign up for classes or something. There's two types of people who do those evaluations. The ones who, the ones who actually have an opinion and the ones who just need to get past it so they can check something in the student center. Right, I wonder what the, what's, I the, second one of what's the ratios of, on those. Okay, so all right, let's talk, today we're gonna talk about program analysis. So for the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about more kind of advanced topics and advanced uses of this compiler technology. And one of them was optimization, 
that you can, instead of just translating your code, you could actually translate it to something that will run faster in assembly, sometimes even faster than hand-coded assembly. Although for assembly experts, that might not be the case. And, and for certain domain-specific work like graphics, uh, hand coding can still be faster. But for the sort of every person who doesn't really know assembly well, you can get really high performance code with these optimizations. And recall that the way we did some of these optimizations was we first did a program analysis step, a step that tried to uh, summarize the behavior of the program for all possible inputs. So why is it that we needed to do this? Why did we need to do this for all possible inputs of the program? Why did we need this soundness property? Yeah. Because uh, if uh, somebody puts something that's outside of your boundaries and you don't uh, and you don't consider that, what happens? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if you've got, yeah, if you've got some function that's like I don't know, computing a derivative or something, uh, and for certain inputs, for certain input values, it doesn't actually compute the right value. It's kind of bad, right? You don't want. You may not want that. So the compiler tries to preserve this soundness property, which is uh, whatever is true in your model of it, in your summary of the inputs will be true at runtime. But importantly, the converse may not be true. So you may over approximate the behavior at runtime. Uh, so some examples, uh, let's see, we looked at some examples, uh, I don't know if it's show an example of this, but in some cases, your program, um, some values may have constants, there may be multiple different constants for the same value. Uh, but if you just approximate constant propagation with either it has one constant value, or you don't know whether it has a constant, then you may lose some precision. Uh, and there are cases you can, you know, there are cases you can construct, can construct where uh, you can kind of trick the compiler into over approximating for constant propagation. So yeah, so this program analysis was essential for optimizations, and I, I think historically it kind of grew out of this. But it, it turns out that these program analysis techniques can be used for more than just optimization. It can be used for um, trying to automatically reason about what your program is doing, and you can do more than just do optimizations. You can do things like Make sure that your program doesn't have any seg faults. That would be really useful, right? No pointer checking. Uh, make sure that for security applications, make sure there's no buffer overflows. You're not, you know, you're not copying a buffer uh, into some other buffer that uh, is not large enough to hold your values. That was exactly the stack smashing attacks vector that we saw last time. Uh, so if we could get these program analyses to be uh, scalable and precise enough to give us this useful information, that would be really, really useful, right? Um, and there are also other techniques besides these static analysis sound techniques uh, where you just do dynamic testing of the program and you can actually automate testing of the program. So right now you guys sit down and you, I give you test cases or you, maybe you construct them by hand. Uh, but imagine if you had a program that would just automatically create test cases for you. That'd be pretty great, right? And these kinds of tools do exist in the wild. Um, yeah. So next semester I'm teaching a course on static analysis. It is a grad course, so you would need like permission to get in. Uh, and it's mostly going to be static analysis. We won't talk about the dynamic analysis. If you're really interested in this automated testing, I'm not going to go over it in this class, but this is a book that comes highly recommended to me, the fuzzing book. It's very, very practical. It'll show you how to use tools that'll basically automatically generate inputs, like millions of inputs to like stress test your program and make sure and find crashes in your program. And it uses automation. So, you know, if you're kind of bored by sitting and hand constructing test cases, this is a it's a good resource to check out. The fuzzing book, free online book. So today we're just going to have a pretty general overview of program analysis. You know what some of the techniques are, what some of the caveats are, uh, what's kind of kind of the design decisions are. Uh, and this is especially important for security because, as you saw last time. Uh, certain security exploits are due to software bugs. Unexp you know, what is a bug? A bug is not the program doing something wrong. It's a misunderstanding by the developer of what the program is doing. So when when somebody wrote that that vulnerable code that's vulnerable to a buffer overflow, uh, that programmer did not think about that case. They didn't think about the case when the input buffer is being overflowed by an attacker. Um, and so the program was not wrong per se. It's just that was the unexpected behavior, but it's what the program actually does. The program actually allows this kind of uh, privilege escalation. So these kind of software bugs have have pretty bad uh, security um, ramifications. So, for instance, in this case, I don't know what year this was, but somebody found a way to delete any Facebook photo album from 
anybody, any user on the website. So that's probably some programming bug. And actually nowadays finding bugs is really profitable because if you find a security exploit, you can sell this to some, you know, maybe unreputable people who want to use it before anybody knows about it and it gets fixed. Um, so the question is, how can you tell for the software that you're relying on, and you know, more and more we're relying on software to protect our personal information, how do you make sure that it's actually safe and correct and doing what it's supposed to do? So recall last time, security was about, you know, showing that, uh, making sure that programs don't do what they're not supposed to do. Correctness is making sure the program does what it's supposed to do. Security is making sure the program doesn't do what it's not supposed to do. You know, kind of two, two sides of the same coin. Uh, and it turns out that for, it turns out that these techniques from the compiler world for doing program analysis, uh, if you can prove correctness of the program, you can also prove the absence of problems in the program. And we'll talk more a little bit more about that in a second. Okay, so there are two main categories of program analyses. One is static analysis, and that's the kind of source code analysis or you know, analysis without running the program. It might be source code or binary analysis, but it's the kind of analysis that the compiler does uh, while it's converting code to a lower level language. It's analysis that you can, you can reason about all executions of the program, more or less, uh, without having to just compile and actually run it on, on inputs. Dynamic analysis is the opposite. Dynamic analysis is trying test cases and trying to break the code or trying to find some weakness in the code by running test cases on it. So those are the two main categories of program analysis. So high level overview, you know, 500 foot overview or whatever the units of measurement is. You have some kind of code. So maybe you're an engineer at Google or Facebook and you're committing some new feature to, to the company's service. And you wanna make sure that you didn't expose some null pointer error or some buffer overflow attack. So you have your code, you have some specification about what it's supposed to do. You give it to your magic program and analyzer, and you're going to get this report about where potential vulnerabilities are. And nowadays, even you know, big software engineering shops will run these program analysis tools uh, automatically um, integrated with the build system. So every time you know the build and version control system. So every time you do a commit, or every time they need to go to production, they'll uh, just run these in the background automatically. And yeah, yeah. Da oh, dangling pointer, dangling pointer. Uh, I think that's like a pointer that hasn't been freed. Oh no, it's a pointer that's pointing to free memory, sorry. So it's pointing to a freed. So this is like a use after free vulnerability. Yeah, that's a dang pointer. I didn't set the, I didn't set the thing in my link list to null after free, after freeing the thing. Uh, well, it's just that you freed it, but then you still have a pointer that has that address. So if you go and say, say the memory the memory allocator allocates something that uh, has somebody's password in it, uh, and the attacker can control that old pointer, then you know maybe that the attacker is allowed to read that old pointer. They're allowed to print it out to to the console. Um, and if that memory has been reallocated to something sensitive and they're able to read or write it, that's, that could be a security, security problem. Okay, so, and, and I think um, a lot of shops these days will actually give these reports to the developers, you actually, or maybe to the, the test engineers. Uh, I'll actually give the reports from these automated bug finding tools. So Facebook, FB Infer, this tool Facebook Infer, they hired some really strong static analysis people who have done some uh, really great work on automatically finding these kind of memory corruption problems in Java and C. Uh, okay, so hopefully everybody now, by now can recognize this structure on the left. So to see how you know what what these what these reports mean. So this structure is what 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 is this structure called? Control flow. Yeah, your control flow graph. Uh, and so if this is the control flow graph of my program, so remember the control flow graph represents every possible execution in the program, but it's without considering the actual branch conditions, this is an over approximation because you know, we have a cycle here. 
that's an infinite loop without without doing something like having your lattice with your your bottom value. Remember the bottom value in lattice. You know you can't uh, lower the values anymore. You can't union the uh, live variables anymore. Uh, and so that data flow analysis allows you to process this in a finite uh, number of steps. Uh, but at runtime, if we look at the runtime behavior of this program, each path through this control flow graph represents one program execution. So if you imagine you have your program, there's lots and lots of branching, lots and lots of loops. If you give it one input, and you were to sit there and trace through every branch that is taken when you give that input or you know run gdb or something you would get one path through this control flow graph make sense with me so far on this and so you can think of the inputs as being particular paths through our program you know assuming there's no randomness being used if it's deterministic then well even, even in that case, the, the random number generators are also deterministic. They just have different seeds. You can think of those as different inputs. There's going to be one unique path or one particular path for that, for that input. Okay. So the reason that, um, and this, is, this plays into the reason uh, why you need soundness in the compiler, <clears throat> is that if we think about individual inputs, they only examine some subset of the whole behavior of the program. And this is why programming is so hard, right? Because if you, you know, it's like, oh, I tested my program on these five examples. Why don't the secret examples work? Well, when you tested it, you didn't test every possible thing that the program could do. You just tested some narrow set of conditions potentially. And so there's even kind of an art to taking the program and figuring out what good test cases are. And for the dynamic analyses, some of them can actually, that's actually what they do is they look at the program and automatically figure out uh, new test cases to exercise the code. But when you're programming, you know, as, as you develop your experience in programming, you'll start seeing uh, when you write code, you can already think like, oh, what are the inputs that are going to test this code, right? So for those of you who are more experienced, you'll start, you'll start noticing this. Uh, and it's, you know, if you want to program safely, you try to think about all possible inputs to the program like the compiler does. Okay, so the main point here is that, you know, if you test an input, you're just testing some subset of all the possible behaviors here. So a little question. So programs in general, how many of these traces through the program do we have for a given program? What's that? Could be infinite, right? Could be infinite. You could have an infinite number of these. It could be a, um, it could be a windowing manager that just has an infinite loop on purpose, right? Like sometimes, you know, when, if you have an infinite loop in your compiler, that's bad, right? But it doesn't mean there's no use for an infinite loop. If you have some event-driven system mm -hmm. or you have some windowing system, you just have some event loop that's just waiting. A clock application that eventually turns itself off is kind of useless. Yeah, sure. Right, right. Um, so yeah, there could be a potentially infinite number of these traces. So that's exactly why testing, just testing individual inputs, is so hard to get a comprehensive view of the safety of your program. If you're just testing individual inputs, it's hard, not entirely impossible, uh, to get a comprehensive view of your program. So what if this <clears throat> list of, <clears throat> excuse me, what if this list of uh, traces through the program is finite? What, what does that tell you about the program? Or at least the program inputs? There's only a certain amount of tests you can do. Yeah, there's, only, there's a finite number of tests you have to do. So if this were finite and you had the time to spend, you technically could run every possible taste. You could you could test for this uh, for this program. But usually, when we talk about program analysis, we want to be kind of general. So in general, there's going to be infinite infinite uh, traces through the program. So with static analysis, with static analysis, we want to be able to prove even when there are infinite numbers of inputs, infinite behaviors, we want to still be able to prove something about the program for all possible inputs. And this is exactly what our live variable analysis did. It was a finite analysis that could be guaranteed to terminate. So remember there was like this argument for why it terminated with this like lattice of a finite height. All that meant is that it'll terminate eventually. Like the worst case is that you think all variables are live and you can't get worse than that. You'll, uh, because there's a finite number of variables, finite number of blocks, 
you can always be guaranteed to terminate. And that's true even if the program never terminates. That's still, it's still true even if the program terminates. So static analysis, that's the whole game in static analysis. Try to characterize the program across all of its possible, possible inputs. And um, you can actually use this to search out bugs and show that there are bugs in the, in the program. That's more like symbolic execution. Uh, or you can prove the correctness of the program, which is the absence of bugs. So for a lot of uh, static analysis bug finding finders, they are um, verification style tools. So instead of proving that there's a bug, they try to prove the program safe. And if they can't prove the program safe, then there might be a bug. There might be a bug. Okay, that's in contrast to dynamic analysis, where, as we saw before, you have to pick, hopefully intelligently pick, certain inputs to try that are hopefully going to lead you to some security violation, a crash or uh, behavior that you don't expect. Uh, and dynamic analysis is really good at showing that there is a bug. Because if you find that input and it breaks your program, that's an extremely good evidence that your program is broken, right? Because it's the actual input. For static analysis, that may not be the case. If you're just trying to prove correctness and you can't, it's either because your, um, if you can't, uh, it's either because the uh, program actually has a bug or because your approximation is too imprecise. Uh, but with dynamic analysis, you, it's pretty hard in general, actually it's impossible in general to prove that there's an absence of bugs. Because in order to do that, how would you have to prove there's an absence of bugs by testing? You literally have to do every single input, right? Unless you, and now, of course, there are approaches that combine static and dynamic approaches, clever approaches that do that. So they can work together. These are not you know, mutually exclusive categories. Um, and so as you know, Andy Chow from Coverity, which is a static analysis company that makes static analysis tools for, like, for, for a while, uh, if you pick up like a software engineering textbook, you know, the, they'll give you this classic line that you know, the cost of software is like all in maintenance, some, you know, insanely high uh, price of software is in the maintenance part. Yeah, and so of course there's a cost to security as well. Okay, so techniques for doing dynamic analysis. You can um, do more than just try to blindly generate inputs. You can generate inputs and actually trace what the uh, program is doing. You know, you don't have to do, so black box testing is you just give it inputs, test the output, but you can open up that box a little bit and try to trace what you're doing as you're running through the program. So for instance, if you want to, um, if you want to be uh, sure that your tests are exercising new pieces of code, you can keep track of where in the code, the stat in, in the static code, the static blocks, like where in that control flow graph you've already seen and try to generate inputs that are going to exercise new parts of the code. Um, but uh, so yeah, so so fuzzing, so or at least so fuzzing is a kind of a loaded term. There's like black box fuzzing, gray box fuzzing, white box fuzzing. White box fuzzing might actually be static analysis. Gray box is like a blend kind of. Um, but in general, these are just generating inputs and trying to break your code. And for the black box approach, you know, it depends on you know what we talked about last time. It depends on your threat model. So if the attacker you know doesn't know what your program is, they don't have access to it. Then black box testing is kind of appropriate because that's going to be if that's your the threat that you think you have, you don't have an insider threat, then black box testing is kind of what you need to use. Um, yeah. Anyway. So, yeah. So static analysis, you know, this this goes a long ways back, even before it was sort of popular for security, uh, especially out of the compiler world, to kind of prove what a program does. And there's a long history of program verification which even though um, verification is not directly uh, originally for security, it was to prove that a program is doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, it has you know, uh, useful applications in, um, for security. Okay, so let's look at static analysis. So with static analysis, the goal is to uh, identify, well, yeah, the goal is to prove that there is an absence of, code, of bugs of a certain class. And this is, brings us back to soundness versus completeness. So soundness, we talked about a little bit. So who can tell me what soundness is again? Does anybody remember what's remember is about soundness with our data flow analysis? Any takers? Yeah. It's like making sure that something should have the value expected. 
kind of, sort of, kind of. Yeah, sort of, kind of. So yeah. you can think of like you have a model of what the program does, some summary, some data structure that's describing what the program does, and then you have the actual program. And with soundness, if you have soundness, then what you say about the, uh, what you prove about the model will be true at runtime. But subtly, the converse is not necessarily true. And how you kind of frame bug finding versus verification makes an important but subtle difference here. So if I'm trying to prove, if so, okay, so for some static uh, bug finders, they're not actually trying to find the bug, they're trying to prove the absence of bugs. So if my soundness criterion is this program has no bugs, then by proving that my model of the program has no bugs, if it's sound, it guarantees that the program actually has no bugs. So the uh, this is the same with type checking. So type checking you can think of as a kind of bug finding tool, right? And you even use this when you're when you're programming statically. You like say, oh, okay, this this function wasn't defined yet, or I used the wrong name. So these are these are kind of like runtime bugs, right? These are runtime bugs, and the and the type checker proves their absence. So so what what is the type checking? You set up all the rules of the type system, and then you write a little algorithm to walk through the tree and prove that all of the operands have the types of their operators. And so that's the same kind of, so if you extend that to other kinds of program defects like null pointer errors or uh, buffer overflows, you can use a similar kind of reasoning to prove the, uh, to find bugs or prove the absence of bugs. The problem is if we are trying to prove the absence of bugs and use that to say that there are bugs, we have a little bit of a problem. Because with soundness, remember, if, I, if my sound analyzer says there are no bugs, well, it's true that the program has no bugs. But what happens when my analysis says it can't prove there are no bugs? What does that mean about the program? Any takers? If I have a sound analysis and it says, I don't know, I can't prove that this program is correct, or that I can't prove that this program has no type check type problem, I can't prove that this program has no null pointer errors. Uh, what does that say about the actual program? It might, it might not. It might, it might not. Exactly, exactly right. So re keep in mind that this is like a classic problem from discrete, right? This classic uh, kind of uh, uh, unintuitive thing about, about propositional logic. Even if I prove that A implies B, that does not mean that B implies A. So the, anal the analogy I always like to use is, I say, if it's sunny out, I will go to the beach. And so if you go out in the world and it's sunny out and I'm at the beach, am I lying? I wasn't lying, right? If I go, if it's sunny out and I'm not at the beach, well, I lied to you, right? Because I said, if it's sunny, I will go to the beach. But the tricky case is, if it's raining out and you go and you see me at the beach, was I lying to you? I wasn't lying, right? Because I said, if it's sunny, I'll go to the beach, but I didn't say anything about the other case. So kind of in kind of informal logic, we sort of assume that that's the case, right? But in this formal propositional logic, this uh, proposition is one directional, basically. And so B implies A does not follow from A implies B. So this seems kind of like a kind of a subtle minor point, maybe. Um, and it's kind of a pain for these static checkers, because if you just have to prove correctness, and then when you can't prove it, you don't know. You, you don't know whether it's actually a bug or not a bug. Uh, that can be kind of annoying if you're, if you're always saying, I don't know. You know, if your static analysis is very imprecise, like the data flow analysis, um, that can be pretty frustrating because what does that mean? That means it's a false alarm. It means the program is actually safe and your analysis is saying, no, this is not safe. And then your boss is saying, oh, you gotta fix this bug. Oh, but that's not a real bug. Um, all right. so. Why, not, why can't we just create an analysis that can not only, uh, if it says there are no bugs, there are no bugs. Why can't it, we also have an analysis where if the program actually has no bugs, our analysis will say there's no bugs. Why can't we have the converse? So the converse of soundness is called completeness. So it's exactly the converse of what we were saying. If the actual program has no bugs, then our analysis will say there's no bugs. So if this, if we have completeness and soundness, then our model and our program will always match. Make sense? So this is problematic for what is really a pretty subtle reason. 
any takers why why it's so it's super subtle and I wouldn't expect you to know it but any like intuition why how we can create such an analysis what if we have an analysis that's only complete but not sound what will that give us Uh, kind of. I mean, so usually testing, testing is like complete because it can give you an answer on every program. But if it's not sound, then it doesn't really matter if the, the analysis says there's no bugs. It's not sound. So there's no guarantee that it's saying there's no bugs means there's a bug. Following that argument, following that line of argument. So if you have completeness without soundness, then your analysis can say whatever it wants. It can just say always, it can always just say no bugs. And it would technically be, it would, yeah, it would technically, well, technically be complete. Mm -hmm. But if it's not sound, then yeah, I mean, yeah. it's not, it's not asserting that it's right. It's like saying I can answer every question, but I might lie to you, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. So this is a table of this soundness versus completeness, and this is like always confusing because it's like these these minor differences in logic, but they have like big consequences for the meaning of your analysis. So let's take a look at the you know, matrix of all combinations of these. So what we really want is sound and complete. We want something that is going to be right whenever it says something, and that is going to be able to answer that question on every program. So if a program doesn't have bugs, it'll always be able to tell you. That's what we want. But as you can see in red here, that's not going to be always possible. So what about the, the, the case here? If we have incomplete and unsound. Uh, so the case where, the case, as your classmate pointed out, if you have a sound analysis uh, and it can't prove that the program is safe, then the program may either be unsafe or it may be safe and your analysis is just imprecise. So those kinds of warnings are called false alarms, right? Because it says, I can't do anything about this. I can't prove whether it's safe or not. So you as the programmer have to kind of go in and confirm whether there actually is a bug or not. So that's what happens when you have a sound but not complete analysis. When you have an unsound analysis that is complete, you may not get, you may, uh, so this is like a testing approach. If you have a test that can find bugs sometimes but can't test every possible input, then it's complete because it's gonna technically, you'd be able to run it on every uh, program that you have, but you know it's not sound. So sometimes, so it's not necessarily a bad thing to be unsound and incomplete and in, uh, unsound and complete uh, because this is what testing is and testing has uh, been proven extremely effective because even though you can't test all inputs you can test a whole lot of inputs millions of them really really fast and find real real bugs um, so being able to work on every program is an important property to have uh, and so if you have a uh, an unsound analysis this yeah yeah go ahead Yeah. Um, if you do that one first, which one? Force all errors. Yeah. No, uh, no, no, that may report false alarms. If you do that first, then you, you get all of your errors. And then if you do that one, it may report this one? Uh, no false alarms and it will get rid of all of the rest of false alarms. Oh, um. Hold on a second. So you're saying you could take yeah. this analysis and this analysis and combine them and get this analysis. Yeah. That would be nice. <laughs> so the problem is this one is unsound. Right, but if, if you do that one, that reports all the errors. And then if you do this one, that gets rid of all the false ones. Let's, let's go to this little graph here. I think this will help understand it uh, before, I, before I continue on that. So th this is a good point. So the, the point is, well, can I just like take two analyses and, and get a sound and complete analysis. Can I do that? So here, here's the issue. So kind of graphically, a sound analysis is creating a model of the program. So, okay, so in the cloud here, this is the real program's behavior. So this is like the infinite set of traces, the potentially infinite set of traces. You know, you have all possible inputs, all possible traces in the program. This is the behavior of this, this is the real behavior of that program. With static program analysis that's trying to prove the safety of the program, the way it works is it creates an approximation of all of the behavior of the program 
but it's an over approximation, which means that if the program can't be proven safe, we don't know whether that's a, that's a behavior inside of the real program or that's a behavior inside of our model of the program that is not actually some valid trace that cannot actually be uh, a valid, it's not actually a valid input to the program. Okay, so let's say we do our, our uh, static analysis first and we get, we get this alarm. You know, we get this alarm. We don't know whether it's a false alarm or a true alarm. As your classmate pointed out, well, why can't we then switch to a unsound and, in, and complete analysis to check, essentially check all of these cases here, right? Like we could rule out whether it's a false alarm. The problem is it's not sound. So it may, it may not be able to give an, it may not give the right answer on all of these, on all of these, all these questions. It may not be able to like tell you whether, you know, it may, it may not even find the bug in the first place. So if it can't find the bug, you don't know whether that's because the bug is here or because, I'm sorry, I misspoke. So it's, it's actually going to search this, the space of the real program. Uh, okay. Maybe I should, maybe I should draw a diagram. Maybe I should draw a diagram. I think, I think, I think I need to make, I need, think I need to draw a diagram for this. So let me do this real quick. Hey, you can avoid ever giving false alarms by just saying everything's good. <laughs> um, yeah, but it wouldn't be sound. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the point. That, right, right. That's the, that's the I, unsound and complete I analysis, can, right. I can avoid it to ever give you a false alarm by always telling you that everything's working perfectly fine. Right, and you can always avoid, you can always be complete by always saying there's a bug. So you're technically sound because if the soundness criterion is when I say I'm safe, the program's safe, I can just always say not safe. And technically, I'm still like I'm trivially sound, right? Okay. Anyway, so we have our, oops, gotta turn this off. All right. So we've got our actual program here, our actual program behavior, and we've got our model of the behavior. So if we've got, okay. So let's say we've got a. Uh, okay. So first case, we run our static analysis. And, it's, and it can't prove the safety of this model of the program. And let's assume, you know, we know that the bug is here. So the hope is that we can take a complete analysis that may not be sound and rule out whether this is a false positive or not. The problem is, if we run that incomplete but unsound analysis, it may run, it may find all the bugs here. It may, it may be able to find all the bugs here, but because it's unsound, when it says there's no bug, it might be because the bug is in a, in a place that it hasn't tested. So even by combining these two approaches, because you, because you lose soundness when you get completeness, you can't rule out that the bug was, was here in our program. Uh, and because when you use the sound analysis, you can't tell the difference between a bug uh, inside of the real program space and outside. So you can't tell the difference between whether the bug was here or here. Yeah, it's like you can't win, right? It's like you can't win. Um, so this, but this is only true in general. So if you have a program that's like very, very small, has a finite state, you could just test all of it, right? Uh, for certain programs that. Um, the static analysis is like not an over approximation for. So there are certainly cases where you can have not an over approximation for certain programs. Um, you know, you don't have false alarms. You won't have false alarms. So this is a property in general of program analyses. And there is actually a proof that this, uh, that it's not possible to have both of these. So, uh, you know, as I kind of intuitively pointed out, if you combine these two analyses, you don't get sound and complete. If you want it sound and complete, it would be not possible in general, in general for all programs. So it's, it's not that it's not possible ever or sometimes. It just means that for all programs, you can't write one program that will be both sound and complete. So why is this? Any intuition about why this is? I don't expect you to know this. This is like beyond me as well. I mean, this is like famous work in computer science by like famous computer scientists. Any intuition why, why, why it might be like impossible to do 
Yeah. There's theoretically infinite programs. Okay. There's infinite and programs. And having one program that could instantly solve every potentially infinite test case is impossible. Yeah, that seems <laughs> that, that's kind of reasonable if you have infinite programs, maybe. Yeah, because if you had a finite number of programs, well, you could just like encode whether it has a bug or not in a big table, right? You could have a big table and put the text of each finite program, figure out on your own, well, this one has a bug, this one doesn't. And there, there's your sound of complete analysis, right? You just check, you just match the program. So yeah, if you had infinite programs, that's a problem. So what about for static analysis? What if you have infinite inputs? Infinite inputs are a problem too, right? Because remember our, what our data analysis, how our data analysis got around dealing with infinite possible traces is it did this approximation. And that's where you have this discrepancy between what the approximation says about the program and what the program actually does. So with constant propagation, you may have, the pro, in order to not account for every possible infinite combination of, of uh, well, very large combination of constant values, uh, it just sort of gives up after there's two possible constant values. So that, you know, that, that this is, that's the over approximation part. So anyway, there's some famous results basically going back to Turing. Do you guys know who Alan Turing is? Who, raise your hand if you know who Alan Turing is. Oh, okay, okay, good. Raise your hand if you don't know. Okay, so he's like, you know, father of computer science. He proved uh, an important result, this, this, uh, this uh, undecidability problem. So the, the question was, well, kind of intuitively, the question is, uh, if I give you a program, any program, can you write another program that will tell me whether that program halts ever? Like, is it ever have an infinite loop or does it, does it halt at some point? And so kind of intuitively, this gets to this like notion of infinite traces. Can you have a program that itself will halt, but check that another program won't halt? And tell you be able to tell you that. And uh, actually, Wikipedia has a really good like illustration of this proof. Of the proof. Uh, it's basically a proof contradiction. Um, I'm not a formal computer science guy. I can kind of give you the intuition. Where is it? Uh oh. Is this it? Oh yeah, here we go. Proof concept. So this is a nice intuitive, intuitive uh, thing about this. <clears throat> so the kind of intuition behind this, so I'm not a formal computation guy, so I may butcher this, but the idea is if you had a program that could, t could tell you whether another program halts or not, what you could do is you could construct a new program using that the program that solves the halting problem uh, and come up with basically a contradiction. Mm -hmm. So what, how, does that, how, do, how does this work? So I could construct a program called G that runs this program you assert will, halt, will solve the halting problem, will tell you whether a program halts or not, and just like, you know, mess with it. If that program says the program halts, then I loop forever. If it says it doesn't halt, then I terminate. So it's just con it's intentionally like messing with this program you say is going to is going to tell me whether a program can halt or not. And I uh, yeah I construct a program that like looks you know it calls itself and intentionally does not halt or halts depending on the output of the program. So that's that's the essence of the like proof by contradiction that Turing did. And it turns out that um, you can. You can extend this to not just the halting problem, but to any interesting program analysis. So this is Rice, another famous computer scientist, who used the halting problem to prove that you could not have a sound and complete analysis in general. Because if you could, you could solve the halting problem. You can't solve a halting problem, therefore, you can't have a sound and complete analysis for, you know, for, for um, in general, for any program. So this is the kind of uh, programmer sketch. I like these because I'm a programmer, not a formal guy. So having an actual program to look at makes sense for me. Uh, okay, so let's say you could 
create a uh, program analysis that can tell you some property of the program. Let's say I write a program analysis that can say for every program whether the given program T squares a number. You with me on this? So I write a program, I, I say, hey, you write a program analysis for me that if I give you any program, you'll tell me if it's squaring a number. So simple thing, right? You just tell me that. So you could imagine like writing, you know, you could even use your, comp your, your compiler right now to say, oh, do I have X times X? And you could actually just tell me right now, okay, that program is squaring, right? Um, but to say to do it, you could do it for all programs means, again, I could construct a program such that if you solve, if you can, um, if you can uh, tell me for every program, it will also solve the halting problem. Okay. Now, again, not a formal guy, so I have to walk through this reasoning. Okay, so I could solve the halting problem by constructing a new function out of my program analysis function that's, that runs your program. So this is what the program does. It runs the program in question. You're trying, uh, so this is asking, does A halt on input I? And so I construct a new program called T that, at least in the code, runs the program that either halts or doesn't halt, and then just returns n times n. OK, why does this work? So if A halts, then this is a squaring function, right? If it halts, this thing is a squaring function. See what I'm saying? Yeah. If it doesn't halt, then you could never have reached this return n times n, and it's not a squaring function. So if you could construct this, then you could solve the halting problem. And you could just do this for any, uh, you know, any kind of property of the program. <clears throat> With me on this, and this is kind of like logical. This is like logical puzzles, right? These are like mind benders doing this. Questions on this? I, again, I'm not a formal computation theory guy. You can take a class on that here. Take discrete two, learn more about this. But any questions on this? Yeah. So if it just if it halts, you'll do this function to return the thing, and then you'll know that it halts. Is that what you're trying to say? Uh, oh, so okay. So, so is a squaring function doesn't necessarily run this program. It does something, you can imagine it's like a static analysis that could read this function and tell you whether, whether uh, AI halts or not. So uh, of course, if it were a testing approach, is a squaring function itself would never halt. And so it would not be able to, it would, you know, it wouldn't be able to solve the halting problem. If you can't halt, you have to be able to stop and tell me, does, it, does this program halt or not? So whether this is running or not is kind of, yeah, it's not really running. It's your, you have a program that can take this constructed function in and tell me whether it squares or not, by any means, whatever means it is. If it's going to do, do it by running, well, that's not going to work if it has to run it. Make sense, kind of? So this is all very kind of mind-bending stuff. Yeah, no, yeah. Okay, anyway, so that was sort of a, a big tangent on, okay, so that's why you can't do this <laughs> in general, in general, in general. So you can certainly do it for finite programs. You can do it for large classes of programs. So in spite of this, in spite of this undecidability, program analysis designers have made very, very good program analyses that will be precise enough to even solving the halting problem for certain, for certain functions. So there are, there is work. So I think it's, uh, it's called the Terminator, but if I search that, that is also has a name clash. Well, anyway, yeah. So there, there's there's a program that just will be like, well, screw undecidability. I'm going to solve the solve the halting problem anyway, and they do very well. They can actually prove for a lot of cases uh, whether your program actually holds or not. It's just that elusive in general case. And so, as you can imagine, m many of the programs you write are kind of formulaic. They, you, you aren't writing any possible program. You're writing a lot of kind of very similar programs. So you can imagine that you can write analyses that will, that will uh, uh, be able to answer these questions for you know, large classes of programs. OK, questions so far? Questions on this? Fun stuff, right? Isn't this fun? No? Yes? Big discrete flashbacks. Big discrete flashbacks? Well, this is, I mean, the, the logic is really simple, right? Yeah. It's just the, 
the ideas are like very confusing and kind of deep, right? But the logic is super simple. It's just proof by contradiction and like A, A implies B, B implies A, you know, it's, but it's, it's very hard to wrap your head around. I, 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 I definitely um, commiserate with you. All right, any que other questions on this? All right, so let's go back to like, you as a software engineer and you're getting results from these, this, as, as these uh, program analysis tools. So now you know, if you're at Google or whatever, or wherever great place you're all gonna go, uh, you get results back from your static analysis and it says there's a memory leak on this line and you've checked it over and over and over again. And it's like, there's no memory leak there. I can prove it mathematically there's no memory leak there. It might just be that your program analysis is sound but not complete and giving you a false alarm. And so on another day, you may uh, end up in the news because some security violation, or some you know, buffer overflow in, in your server exposed all of your clients' uh, social security numbers and credit card numbers. And you may say, well, but I ran the fuzz tester for like several weeks. Why? Because it's complete, but it's unsound. It's not going to comprehensively tell you every possible input. And that, you know, that's why today, if you look at the you know, CVE database, the National Vulnerabilities Database, Common Vulnerabilities Exposures Database, you'll see there are still these same kind of bugs coming out all the time. Buffer overflow attacks still happening all the time. Part of it is like legacy code, but. Okay, so we kind of went over this already. You know, you've got, uh, yeah, this is, your, this is your cloud of actual behavior. This is your over approximated behavior. Okay. All right. Someone's having fun. Okay. <laughs> Somebody wants to go check, please, by all means. Uh, I can wait for you if you like. Well, there's no other noises, so. All right, Halloween is over. All right, so this is here, here's a here's another example of a program. So here, here's how um, some of these um, over approximation problems can you know th this is why some of the over approximation an illustration of how over approximation can give you false positives. All right, so here's some control flow graph, and just imagine you've got some, some state here, maybe a null pointer error, something happens here where your program crashes. And you want your static program analysis to tell you whether your program crashes or not. So let's walk through this. So first thing to notice is that the logic of this program says if y is zero, then x equals x plus one, x is one, then we go to another if statement, say if y is zero, check whether x is less than zero. Well, as you can see, this is never true, right? Because these two conditions are the same. So you can either take these two branches or this branch. Without considering the branch conditions, you know, every possible path is feasible. If you just can think of the control flow properties of this, of this program without, you know, the actual branch conditions, the data flow properties. Um, so if our, okay, let's forget about that. So th this should be reviewed to you, you know, this, this data flow analysis, you have some values in and the uh, transfer function changes them to values out. But the main point here is that how can I um, keep track of the value of X? So without trying to track every possible state of this, of this variable, so you know X could be continuously being increased by one, right, in this path, or x could be continuously um, decreased, or just uh, decreased by once and then exiting. So this might be, you know, this could be some very large, arbitrarily large loop. Okay, so one of the uh, kind of classic program analyses in order to deal with uh, looking at integers, say you want to make sure you don't have a divide by zero error. Well, one thing you can do to do your approximation, if you want to have a finite approximation, instead of tracking every possible integer value for every possible variable, you can just track whether it's positive, negative, or zero. So that's like one 
Just like with live variables, we had this finite lattice. We have this finite possible set of values for a variable uh, or for, for your analysis. For variables, you can give it a finite possible set of values. So that finite, you can, and you can choose whatever they are. So one common choice is to use you know, positive, negative, or zero. So that already is kind of powerful because you can prove null pointer errors in some cases. You can prove, uh, prove the absence of null pointer errors or prove the absence of divide by zeros, which are two you know, common, common problems. Uh, OK, but if we do that, uh, then what's going to happen? We need, this, we need to deal with this uh, join point. So just like in the live variable analysis, if there are two possible paths, and there's two different uh, ways to um, update the state to those paths, we have the same problem here. Once we reach this join point, we have the case where x is either positive or negative. So what can we say about that? Is it positive, negative, or zero? Well, we don't know. We've reached the bottom of the lattice. We have to assume anything is possible, just like in the constant propagation. We have to assume any possible value. So if we do that, so that's what this means, although, OK, maybe it's top. I always confuse top and bottom of the lattice. But anyway, so it, it basically means we don't know what its value is. Its value could be anything. So at the beginning, we know that it's 0. Along this branch, we know that it's positive. Along this branch, we know it's negative. But just like in the data flow analysis, when we reach this join point, we have to somehow combine this information at this point. Uh, and, to, and to combine that information, we can't say for sure whether it's 0, positive, or negative. So we have to just say. We don't know. And when we do that and we reach this test here, well, we can't prove in this data flow setup, we can't prove that x is less than 0. So we have to assume that this branch is possible. Do you believe me on this? See what I'm saying? But could we improve this? Is there some way we could actually, is there something we could do here? Could we say track, you know, we could actually run the program and track every possible value of x, maybe. If it has an infinite loop, though, that could be a problem. So one thing we can do, so this is the lattice here. One thing we can do is we can keep track of the branch conditions. So instead of just um, tracking our approximate value, zero, negative, positive, we could tag those values with what the branch condition is. So if we could do that, if we could sort of remember and tag these data flow facts with the condition of the branch, then when we get to this point here, we can keep track of both effectively. We can keep track of the fact that under the condition y equals zero, x is positive, and under the condition y does not equal zero, x equals negative. We keep track of both those facts. Uh, and this kind of makes your analysis a little more expensive because your state blows up a little bit and you have to somehow do computation on these, these uh, Boolean conditions. But there's only you know, four possible states for x, you know, 0, negative, positive, or unknown. And so the maximum number of states you're going to store at the same time, maybe you know, if you can actually simplify these Boolean expressions, will be you know, no worse than four states. So when we get to this, this branch here, we can look at all our possible states with their branch conditions and check whether, uh, whether it's actually true under that branch condition. So whoa, this, there's a lot of dotted lines here. So along this path, the yes path, we know that y equals 0. And looking at our set of facts about x, we can rule out that y does not equal 0 and know that x must be positive under this branch. Make sense? Questions on this? Questions on this? And then rule out that there is actually a crash here. And so these days, over the past couple of decades, this problem, this problem of effectively Boolean satisfiability. Who learned about Boolean satisfiability? Did you learn about this? Satisfiability? No? Is this discrete too? They don't, they don't talk about it. The SAT, SAT problem? SAT solvers? Discrete too? Okay. So the, the, it's the sort of a classic problem in algorithms. Can you write an algorithm that, given a Boolean formula, will tell me whether it is can be true or is always false? Seems like a simple question, right? 
I give you like A and B or C. Can you tell me, is that, is that always false or can that be true? A and B or C. What if I have A and B? Can that ever be true? So the idea is that A and B are variables. They could either be true, set to true or false. So if I have A and B, is that always false? A, if A is true and B is true, right. then A and B is true. Yeah, if A is so, true and B is true, A and B is true. So with A and B or C, right. uh, if C is true or A and B is true, then the whole thing is true. Right, right. And if I have A and B and not A, always false, right? If I have A and not A, false. But it turns out if you have a, a gigantic formula, so some, in some of the research I do, I'm working with formulas that have millions of clauses to them. Um, that's not so easy to solve. And it turns out that the problem is NP complete. So it's like you can, you can uh, do no better than, well, I shouldn't say this. So it turns out that like it's been proven to be NP complete. Also, not a, again, not a formal computation guy. You can look at that. Yeah. Uh, so it's the class of problems where there is, uh, oh, let me look it up on Wikipedia. Yeah. So it means you can check the problem in polynomial time, but people suspect that there is no polynomial time algorithm for them. For them. So this is the classic P equals NP problem. Does P equal NP? So nobody has proven for sure whether or not it does equal or not equal. Um, but what we do know is that we can check the problem quickly in polynomial time, you know, like n squared plus n cubed or whatever, you know, that's polynomial time. Uh, but there's been no algorithms for doing this sat checking better than like work, you know, better than, um, you know, some exponential time, you know, two to the n or something like that. And there's a whole class of problems that have this property. And so the big question is, are there polynomial time algorithms for these? So if you can discover a polynomial time algorithm that works in general for all, for Boolean satisfiability, You'll probably get like a million dollars, a couple million dollars. Uh, either way, if you can find an algorithm that does it or prove that there is no such algorithm. Still a big open problem in computer science. So anyway, so that, yeah, so with, um, but it turns out that over the past couple decades, these SAT solvers, these satisfiability solvers, you know, they can figure out whether it's true or false uh, for some possible setting of the variables can be used to hold on to these conditional branches. And so if you just have a tool that will do SAT for you, you can check, okay, given this condition, which of these facts holds in this branch? And you just dispatch it to your SAT solving tool and it'll tell you, oh, this is never true here. So I can just rule this out under this branch. Pretty cool, right? Pretty impressive. It's like, automatically reasoning, automatically doing, and actually these are, they, these can also help with doing automated math proofs. So if you don't like writing proofs by hand, well, you can use automated tools to do them. Okay, so there is actually one more thing I'd like to show you. There's a really good blog post that I will put, uh, I will put up uh, with the lecture slides as well. And it has a nice, a really good description of all this, like, uh, you know, false positives, false negatives, soundness, completeness, has this very comprehensive diagram of, like, every possible case for a tool. So if you have a tool that's sound, if you have a tool that's neither sound or complete, it'll walk through it. This is a really good blog, really good blog post by an excellent researcher in programming languages. I'll put a link to it in, in the syllabus. But highly recommended read. You can learn a little bit more about this soundness versus completeness. Talk about the halting problem a little bit. Uh, and I guess the last thing I want to show you is one of these tools in action. So it turns out that Clang, that framework that LLVM, you know, the same framework that LLVM has, has some of these built-in static checkers. They're static analyses, but the difference is instead of trying to prove the safety, they're trying to prove that a bug exists. So this. Again, these are very you know, mind warping logic problems, logic puzzles to deal with. But so instead of trying to prove the safety of a program, it's trying to prove that there is a bug using static analysis. So it's just similar, same problem, just inverting, inverting the logic. And so if I have a program like this, like this, where I've got, so this is our classic uh, buffer overflow attack. If I'm copying into buffer one, so the first argument is the destination, 
that buffer is of size 10, and I'm copying from buffer 2, that buffer is of size 20, even though I'm using string n copy, you know, that can be safe if you use it properly. It's a little safer than string copy. In this case, is this safe or not safe? Or is there a buffer overflow or is there not a buffer overflow? So I'm saying copy from, from arg size of buff2 into buff1. Is it safe? Buffer overflow, right? Buffer overflow. So with, um, so this is just showing Clang's magic here. It can tell you, well, that don't worry about this. This is just, I didn't declare the header, but it can actually tell you, it'll, it'll actually keep track of, it'll try to keep track of the size of buffers and just do a comparison uh, between the destination. And so it knows about string end copy. It knows that this is, you know, if this size is greater than this, that's bad. Uh, and so it has to keep track of, you know, it has to keep track of buffer sizes. So even though 10 is not here, it has to keep track of that. You can imagine a data flow analysis that's that's doing that. Uh, and it can tell you, it can actually find some of these bugs in some cases. All right, questions? Is that cool? So that's program analysis in a very, very tiny nutshell. I didn't talk about much about dynamic analysis, uh, but check out that fuzzing book. Definitely check out this blog post, which I'll put right now into the lecture slides. It'll give a nice overview of all the slides. So anyway, have a good weekend. Um, yeah, we are here next Tuesday, or at least I am here next Tuesday. If I don't see you, have a good, have a good break. Otherwise, I'll see you next Tuesday. Have a good night. What's that? Yes.